Hey, it's Norm from Tesla.com. I'm here at CES 2014. Could not be more excited, finally, to talk to you guys about the new Oculus Rift prototype. I'm once again, with Nate Mitchell, VP of Product of Oculus. Last year, we saw the dev prototype. Yep. We saw GDC some games, and E3, we saw 1080p panel. But at CES 2014, you have a whole new milestone prototype. You're calling it Crystal Cove. What's new about it? So there's a lot new about Crystal Cove. Um, the two key features that we're demoing uh, here at CES 2014 are actually positional tracking, which is very exciting, which we talked about quite a bit, and low persistence. Um, so diving into each one of those a tiny bit, positional tracking, the, the original dev kit, uh, it only tracked your orientation you know, very accurately in real time. So you move your head, yaw, tilt, roll. Um, it's like your head on a ball. Exactly. Right. So we track that very, very precisely. But if you actually leaned forward into the world to maybe look down at the screen or try to peek around a corner, which is pretty natural in VR to try to do, you, know, you see a window, you're like, oh, I kind of want to look around that. The whole world would just move with you. Uh, we were, weren't able to track that data, and so we were just losing that information. So with positional tracking, um, the demo that we're, we're showcasing here um, with the Crystal Cove prototype, we actually have an external camera that's tracking IR LEDs on the headset, and that allows the player to actually move a lot more naturally in three extra degrees of freedom. So they can lean forward, backward, lean to the left, lean to the right, actually crouch down, look underneath things. So it adds a lot more of a natural experience, and it makes the whole experience more comfortable as well. Talk about more gameplay opportunities for designers, the yeah. whole leaning thing. So in a game like Team Fortress 2 from last year that worked with the Oculus, yeah. it kind of faked the positional tracking by putting the camera in front where the eyeballs were, yeah. so you wouldn't look like you know your camera was in the middle of your head, but you still couldn't really look forward, and, and that's something you can do now. But you're also saying that's also a more natural experience, so how does that work? Yeah, so with the, uh, with the orientation tracking in the, in the dev kit, right, and in the SDK, we do have a head model, a head and neck model. So if you, when you move and lean forward, we can track your position, we can guess your position pretty accurately, but only for a very, very, very short amount of time, and then we lose you, right? And it's basically a really bad guess. Um, so with positional tracking, um, in something like Team Fortress, you can actually just lean all the way down. We can track all of your movements um, within this sort of seated range. We're really trying to nail the seated VR experience. And it, and it does make the experience, uh, like you said, a lot more natural because you want virtual reality to reflect it very precisely the movements you're making in real life. So syncing those two things together makes it a lot more fun. So you're using an optical tracking system, it's a camera and IR LEDs. Mm -hmm. Why an optical tracking system? I know a lot of people like Sixth Sense has with their STEM system, uses magnets, people have kind of hacked the Hydra to work with this. Why optical? So we've experimented with a lot of different tracking systems. You know, we're big fans of the Sixth Sense team. We've done, uh, experimented a lot with like, you know, high-end motion capture systems. At the end of the day, we're trying to deliver a really high-end VR experience that is very comfortable, is affordable, super low latency, that's incredibly critical to the experience, and that we can really continue to tune and optimize for VR. Um, you know, we have a really world-class computer vision team at Oculus, um, scientists uh, <coughs> and research staff, and optical tracking just, after a lot of experimentation, prototyping, it really felt like the right way to go. So again, this, with Crystal Cove, we're showing one of our tracking systems. This may not be the tracking system that we ship in the consumer product, but we are confirming that the consumer version will have positional tracking. Right, that's, that's one of your target goals, and you're, yeah. you're confident in the algorithms that your computer scientists can, can, in combination with the existing IMU, the motion tracking, that you're going to deliver that experience. So it works with you sitting down, and there's a range of motion. When I sat down, uh, you're using some gameplay tricks that you know when you're moving out of the range. For example, the game desaturates when you're out of the field of the camera. Uh, will it work if you're standing up or with you know, some accessories, for example, like the treadmill stuff? Will that work with optical tracking? We'll see. So, I mean, like, like we said before, right now this prototype is really designed for a seated experience. It's, it is optimal for a, a seated experience. It is theoretically possible you could stand up, you could bring the camera up, you could get some range of motion, but how good it'll be on an Omni or something like that, don't know, hard to comment. Absolutely. Okay, so the other thing is persistence of vision, and that ties with the new screen you guys hear. You guys announced it's an OLED screen. Yeah. Uh, I, I can, I'm putting it on, it looks like a 1080p screen. I don't know if you guys are confirming that or not, but definitely OLED, and it looks different than an LCD, because the LCD has your, your mesh, your, your screen door effect, and looking at it, the sub-pixel arrangements might be a little different. How is that new screen working with you guys, and how is low persistent work on that screen? Yeah, sure. So in the Crystal Cove prototype, like you've said, we're using actually an OLED panel. And again, may not be the panel we ship with the consumer version, but it's one of our favorite panels that we've used. And we're able to run the OLED panel 
So actually, let's just start. The biggest difference with OLED technology, one of the biggest differences, is the uh, reduction in pixel switching time. So a typical LCD, it's between 15 and 35 milliseconds pixel switching time. So you write the display, and then the, you light up the pixels, and it takes them 15 to 30 milliseconds to actually change color. That's independent of refresh rate and frame rate. Correct, exactly. That's actually on top. And so when we talk about motion to photons latency, a lot of times we broke out pixel switching time, right? You render the frame, <coughs> well, everything else, but you render the frame, you write the display, pixels change color because that really does affect when your brain is receiving the right image. Um, and it really delays the right image from reaching you for a long time. So with OLED technology, we have a, basically a sub-millisecond pixel switching time. That means we can get um, all of that pixel switching time latency in the motion to photons pipeline sucked out. Um, now, there's a little bit more magic that we're doing, um, and that's low persistence, which is one of the other key features and, and really breakthroughs that we're showcasing on Crystal Cove. So with low persistence, the magic is that we've, we've effectively eliminated motion blur from the panel, as well as judder. Um, Let's explain why those problems exist, sure. first of all, on LCD panels and on traditional OLED panels. <clears throat> sure. So pixel switching time um, is a key part of that, right? It, when, the, <clears throat> when the panel, when you write the panel, obviously it's about, let's say, 16 milliseconds on a 60, frames, uh, 60 hertz panel. And then it takes time for the pixels to change like we just talked about. During that time, there's a lot of smearing, basically. And your eyes are receiving a bunch of incorrect data, right? We've written the right thing, the pixels are trying to get there. But it's basically this sort of buttery, smeary experience that really is hard to focus on images. There's a lack of visual stability in the scene. So like a game, for example, renders a, a picture in front of you. You're inside a house. Right. But, you know, and it may be rendering at 60 frames a second, right. and the panel might be refreshing at 60 hertz, which is matched to that frame rate. Right. But you're, because your head's moving and your eyes are also moving, that 1 60 of a second, that's too slow for your, your brain to figure out that what the details in the scene. Yeah, and I think it, it's really even easier to explain even if, when you start talking about low persistence. Because, so if we eliminate the pixel switching time, right, this, the problem that we're left with is what we call judder. And that's that we write the display, like you're saying, at 16 frames, a, or sorry, at 16 milliseconds it takes to write the display. We turn the display on with zero millisecond pixel switching time, effectively. The image is correct. Ooh, that's good, it feels good. Then, unfortunately, between that moment and the next time you're going to write the frame and light up those pixels, what you actually have is bad data. So unless you're standing absolutely still, in which case you'd be correct, um, if you're moving your head like you're saying, what you're getting is a ton of misinformation that's just, you know, your brain is just, it's, it's causing this scene to look blurry. and. and Jump. And that causes a lot of the motion sickness. Like, yes. I did Euro Trucker for almost two hours on this and almost wanted to, to puke because I was moving my head well, a on lot. Well, right. <laughs> on the original dev kit. On the original dev kit. So yeah, I mean, with positional tracking and low persistence together, part of the magic is that because we're sucking more latency out of the pipeline, it's we're tracking your movements a lot more precisely, we're making the display a lot more natural for your eye, and we really haven't gotten to really how low persistence works quite yet. But eliminating motion blur, it is this substantially more comfortable experience. And really, Crystal Cove is the, uh, the most comfortable VR prototype that we've shown ever. So low persistence vision is what you're calling it. You're calling it magic, and there's a lot of technology and things that come together. So let's talk as much as you can about how that works. I understand you're increasing the frame rate, the rendering frame rate on the computer side, yep. and also on the panel side, maybe you're strobing a little of the light. So not enough to create flicker, but to reduce that persistence. That's right. So what happens is we actually, rather than, in a, in a full persistence panel, you turn on the pixels and you leave the light on until the next frame, like we said. That leaves on that bad data, right? But with low persistence, what we do is we only illuminate the, uh, the pixels for a fraction of each frame. So we basically present the right image and then actually turn off the display. And that means that you're only getting right right, right, rather than right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. And that makes, again, the experience well, you eliminate all that bad data, which makes it a lot more comfortable. And it's better to have no data, the, the light exactly. off, than have bad data, and you're doing it at a high enough strobing, high enough frequency that you're not going to get the flicker. Yeah, that's a really key point. If you don't run a low persistence at a high enough frame rate, you would actually see the, uh, the whole screen flicker. If you put a high-speed camera in there, for instance, you would be able to see the flicker. Now, we've tested uh, low persistence in a number of different frame rates. We're not talking about what this panel is uh, here today, but it really is this magical experience that when you cross this threshold, it makes a world of difference. So all this aggregates into the low latency. You want, your target is sub 20 milliseconds. And right now, what, what, where you are and where are the challenges to get to that? Good question. So these demos are really somewhere between 40, or sorry, 30 and 40 milliseconds. It depends on the content, obviously, but somewhere between 30 and 40. For the consumer version of the Rift, we really want to be sub 20 milliseconds. 
I can't get into all the details of how we're going to get there. It's going to be continuing to optimize our technology. Uh, you know, positional tracking will get better. The display technology will get better. We have some tricks up our sleeve on the software side of things. John Carmack has invested a lot into continuing to reduce motion to photons latency um, and even help games that may not be able to reach the, the high enough frame rate to get to low persistence. So we've got a lot left to announce. Um, so stay tuned for more news there. So let's talk content real quickly. John Carmack's on the team. You guys are publishing games. Any plans to make games? Does John want to make games with Oculus? Absolutely. I think. We don't have any announcements to make today, but making games for VR, first party content, that's something we are really excited about. Um, you know, we've done a lot, the community has been incredible in terms of developing content with VR Jam and everything that we've seen, the team at CCP, you know, announcing E Valkyrie and all of that. We do want to develop some of our own content. You'll see some more news from us there in the future. Um, John is definitely excited about it, the team is excited about it, so it's something we do want to invest in uh, more as we go forward. And in terms of hardware, you guys aren't making any announcements for the consumer version. All you're saying is that these features that previously weren't available in the dev, dev version will be there. Crystal Cove is just another milestone, another prototype. You guys are making more prototypes? Yeah, you're spot on. So these are two features we are con confirming for the consumer version of the Rift. Really crucial breakthroughs. Low persistence doesn't sound like much, but fundamentally changes the experience. Positional tracking always needed to be there. So the consumer Rift is really going to be a magical VR experience. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nate. I'm so excited. I, I want to get this. I know it's not a dev version, <laughs> but our, our time here has to be enough. So I'm Norm from Test City. If you have more questions about the Oculus Rift, post it in the comments below, and we'll try to relay them to Oculus and answer them for you. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And follow us on test.com. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. All right, so we just got out of that Oculus meeting. Mm -hmm. We want to talk about those demos. So yeah. what do we think about the hardware and the actual game demos? So, so the experience was pretty dramatically changed from the dev kit, which we spent a lot of time with at this point. Um, it's a little difficult to compare the 1080p prototype that we saw at E3 last year. Because that um, was still an LCD panel. It was an LCD panel. It had some obvious ghosting that they actually even acknowledged and, and apologized for. And as they were saying, that it was just a prototype, just something they were trying out. Um, so while they didn't say exactly who's making this AMOLED panel, and then didn't say the resolution. Mm -hmm. It's basically we know it's a 1080p. It's a, they said it was 1080p. Um, in the in the pixel subpixel arrangement was pretty obviously a pentile screen. The subpixels when you saw the screen door, were, it wasn't a square screen door. It was more of a diamond shaped screen door. Um, so it may not have been pentile, but it was some sort of non traditional subpixel arrangement. Um, you could definitely see more screen door, I think, with this than you could with the 1080p prototype that we saw at E3. But it's difficult to say because that was six months ago. Yeah, they're very different, but the contrast is really high. The contrast was amazing, as you'd expect with the AMOLED. Mm -hmm. the, the, you, know, you didn't have any of the effect where you had black pixels bleeding through a little bit of the black backlight, which actually made a huge difference in the uh, space sim that we played, the uh, EVE Valkyrie, mm -hmm. which is uh, the upcoming, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically like a Wing Commander or TIE Fighter type game set in the EVE universe. Uh, that's upcoming at some date in the future. So low persistence of vision, which is tied to that panel. They're strobing yeah. the light, so they're turning off the backlight for the individual pixels mm -hmm. between the refresh rate, the refresh cycles. Did that help? I, I, you know, I don't know what helped. I noticed much less ghosting than I have with the dev kit or the 1080p set that we saw at E3. That means when you're moving um, your head, there's things no are smearing. There's, yeah, it's 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 you know it's the drug effect from every every drug movie you've ever seen where they're driving down the highway and this, the lights are trailing out behind you. You didn't see any of that, or you saw very little of that. Right. They told to me a look, versions. for example, in uh, one of the one of the MOBA demos, look at a pillar mm -hmm. and move my head around really quickly. And they said I wouldn't see any blur. Now I can't say that I didn't see no blur but it definitely didn't judder. It was dramatically reduced, and um, on the Valkyrie demo, you're in a virtual cockpit. You could actually lean forward, see the text on the screen, and it was actually legible. Partly because of the resolution, partly because when you moved your head, there wasn't horrible blur. Right, so um, being, having readable text in a virtual world, that's a factor of resolution and also the persistence of vision. Well, and also the combination, the, the 3D stereoscopy has an impact on the text readability as well. Um, the big thing, I think, though, is the fact that there's actually head tracking now. So in addition to turning You're talking about positional pitch, tracking. Positional tracking. In addition to the pivot of your head on a center axis, now it tracks movement in a 3D space. So forward, back, left, and right. You saw on the, on the headset all those little LEDs mm -hmm. 
That's what this optical outside. camera yeah. is sensing. So it's kind of like a really, really fancy Wiimote or Kinect sensor. Or track IR is the obvious yes. example. You know, with a track IR, you put a couple of dots on a hat or you know, put them on your forehead or something like that. With this, they had the points on all sides. So you could actually do like a full Top Gun, I'm checking both sides, which I did a couple of times while I was playing Valkyrie. It's not just on the check front. Your back. And the sides, it's on the top and bottom, It's too. on the top sides, front and bottom. So you could turn 180 degrees and lose the last LED, which it was really hard for me to do in a chair that didn't swivel, though. Right. I so actively you, tried multiple times. Nate said that it was meant to be you sitting in a chair. And when sitting in that chair and moving my shoulders and head all the way around, mm -hmm. if you get to the extremes or leaning forward was the mm -hmm. easiest way to lose the tracking, then you did see like a jump. Mm -hmm. um, and also in the game, they would desaturate the color. That was just or, one of the cues that they yes. said they could use to tell yeah. people, hey, you're getting out of the range. Right. Um, I find it really hard to use the Oculus while standing, just because the you know if your perspective in the game gets tilted from the perspective it, you know in the real world, then you kind of get vertigo and get real tilty. I, I can't imagine. I, I'm really interested to try that Omni treadmill when they bring it around to the office sometimes. So the Omni is something that won't work with the existing head tracking, positional tracking technology. He said it wouldn't work with the setup they had there. He but didn't say they didn't promise. Work. He said no. They, he, they were very non-committal. They didn't say that the they said positional tracking would be in the final consumer version, mm -hmm. but they didn't say exactly what type of technology. And the optical tracking with the algorithms that's the direction they're going in right now. Right. But they could just switch gears. They, and they use, could go the other way. Put a camera on the on the thing and have you put lights around the room. The the thing that the thing that's worth mentioning though is a lot of games modeled pivot based on the the way your neck physiologically works, mm -hmm. right? The way the joints in your neck work. Um, this was much, much better. You know, like, when that is right, it's okay. When it gets a little bit off, then you immediately start feeling nauseous and kind of uncomfortable. The, the actual movement in space seemed much better. And one thing that they did actually say uh, uh, is that the, the head tracking, the external head tracking with the camera and the gyroscopes and accelerometer are all working together as a cohesive whole to give more data and more input and, and more accuracy in the motion simulation. That's, which that's seems their like, magic. So yeah. what do we think could be improved? Um, I, I mean, the panel always could be better. I'd love to see a higher resolution panel. I can't believe I'm saying that, but you know, the the I mean, there are high, there are 1600 p panels exactly that size. So seeing seeing, um, I, however, I have to say I like the the effect of the OLED. Both the increased contrast makes stuff that's dark look much better and more real and feel like I'm in an actual virtual space. And keep in mind, they have to render the game at very high frame rates. They said like console right. games run at 30. Hertz, right, so 30, that's not going to work. 30 hertz locked console game isn't going. There, there's going to have to be dev work that happens. That's not going to work with a low processing vision. You're right. going to get the smearing and the judder. Right. They wouldn't say exactly what they're bumping the frame rate on the software side, on the rendering side, mm -hmm. up to. But they've tried 60, 90. I assume it's going to be higher than that even. So overall, I, I think the experience was, you know, it's always dramatically improved when we see a new prototype from mm -hmm. them. Um, I, I can't wait to play a game like Euro Truck Sim or any of the flight sim games with cockpits with the ability to tilt my head forward and back. They still don't have dates. Right, and it's a good thing because they just got $75 million in funding. Yeah. And what that means is they can take their sweet time to get it right and not rush anything to market. Right. They got to get the hardware right and they got to make sure that the games are out there. So I can expect later this year, maybe in the coming weeks, some big software announcements. Steam GDC, Dev Days is next week. Yep, GDC is that. in March. E3 is in June. I would expect if they're going to launch this year, I would expect to hear game announcements at all three of those events. Probably, it's not going to be something that you're going to maybe spend three hundred dollars on and you'll have five games to play. Right. You know, and they didn't actually say they're still committed to the three hundred dollar price. Although I assume that they they would be. They were pretty tight with that previously. So we'll, we'll just have to wait till the maybe end of this year. Yeah. So that's the Oculus. This is the latest prototype. It has positional tracking, head tracking, lower. Frequency, Low persistence, persistence of, vision. of the vision, less blurring. It looks better. It looks really nice. We'll see you guys later. Bye.